Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming to our talk with Belarusian politician Andrei Sannikov. Mr. Sannikov, thank you so much for coming. It is a great honor for me to welcome you to our studio in England. And I know you're going to come to England soon to present your film, This Kind of Hope. Could you please tell us a little bit more about it? Oh, hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I, uh, this trip is organized by my very good and old friend, uh, Alan Flowers, who is now president of Vanguard Belarusian Society. And uh, uh, it is dedicated to, you know, the promotion of Belarus, of course, the Belarusian situation and the uh, 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 to create more awareness because the situation is very difficult. People are suffering, suffering a lot, and uh, uh, more efforts should be put into helping people in Belarus than, uh, than today, I think. Thank you very much. So could you please tell about your film, what this film is about? It is quite a uh, difficult film for me because it, is, uh, it took a, a very long time, almost 10 years, and uh, I had to allow the crew into my family practically so ne never did it before <laughs> I hope never do it again so it was not... it a documentary it's it is a documentary and uh, there were different ideas uh, why I, I'm not particularly a, I'm not a person who likes uh, himself on the screen and uh, there were initially there were different plans of for this uh, crew to tell the story of several people, uh, to combine it with something something else except documentary. But then they eventually came to the idea that they want to hear the direct speech. And right. the direct speech was, uh, I was supposed to provide this direct speech. So that's why uh, you won't hear even the people who are interviewing me on, on re very rarely. So they tried to do it in, in a way that I, I was uh, telling uh, about the historical events in Belarus and uh, my part in it and uh, how I view it. Thank you very much. I'm just going to put down the uh, the film itself and people will be able to see that 15th of March at 1945, there will be film screening of the film biography uh, of about Andrei Sandikov, yes, this kind of hope. And uh, I also hope that there is a hope for Belarus and, and hope for everybody. So um, I will not disclose any more about the film. Please come and watch it for yourself, find out for yourself. And I understand, Andrei, that you are going to talk to people as well. I understand that there will be a talk, and uh, this is the dates on the 15th of March from 4 o'clock to 5.30. It will be at uh, Kaywar Center, London South Bank University. And I will put all the information at the description for this talk. So, Andre, could you please tell me a little bit more about your vision of European Belarus? Yeah, I will talk to people. That That is actually was one of the reasons that I agreed to do this documentary, because uh, uh, I'm not interested in myself, but I wanted to do everything to promote Belarus and to promote this situation, and, uh, to have a chance to talk to people uh, in connection with this film. Uh, Belarus, uh, European Belarus is the uh, that's the civil campaign that I belong to. Mm -hmm. uh, it was founded in 2008 uh, uh, with, I think, in the in the declaration of this campaign uh, there was a press conference took part uh, uh, very famous uh, Belarusian politicians like uh, Mikhail Marinich unfortunately he died uh, not without the help of, of Lukashenko's regime because he was in prison and he was uh, he had a, a stroke there and uh, Viktor Ivashkevich one of the founders of the <coughs> Belarusian National Popular Front also unfortunately uh, died early very early because he needed a liver transplant again you know it is uh, directly or indirectly the, the lukashenko kills people in belarus uh, in, in 
quite an impressive numbers. Nikolai Statkevich, who is now in prison, and we haven't heard from him and myself. So it was, uh, we thought that it was quite uh, appropriate at that time when uh, the uh, dances with uh, Russia uh, were quite active to, 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 to declare the, the real direction in which Belarus should be moving. And it is European direction, of course. Right? Because it is very simple. It is very simple. You know, ask anybody. Uh, is 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 there any law in to the east of Belarus? No. Can you can you survive there if uh, you will be living in a criminal situation even with, even without war? You know, it it, it, is, it was very clear that in Europe we have uh, laws and uh, the citizen rights are protected unlike Russia. So the, the choice is obvious for us. Yes, I understand you were very, very active in the protests of 2010. So uh, you were in prison and I remember on one of the protests of 2020, it was a women protest in London where I also participated and we were reading your letter that you wrote to a sister from the prison and it was very moving. So you also had this experience of being in Belarusian prison and uh, after the protest of 2010, you had the same repressions and the same level of uh, oppression that people experience now in 2020, but the scale was a little bit smaller. Could you please give a little bit of comparison so people who are listening to us now will understand a bit more about your participation in the protest of 2010 when it was European Belarus, with a slightly different topic and slightly different political program and protest of 2020, which was sort of Belarus for Belarus and no uh, agenda, Russia, Europe, they decided not to have this topic on their flags. What is your take on that? You know, it's, uh, I, I wouldn't say that it is different because the, these are elements of the same process of the resistance of Belarusians. And uh, it started in, uh, let's say, soon after Lukashenko came to power, because he came to power as a populist. Uh, people, it, it was clearly a protest vote. It was not the vote for, it was vote against Kebich, who was uh, keeping Belarus in, in, in stagnation, who was absolutely incapable uh, manager. Speaking of managers, and there was a situation where people uh, uh, didn't see any hope connected with the old authorities and they preferred populist Lukashenko to, <coughs> for example, national leader Bozniak or uh, Stanislav Shushkevich, who was quite an experienced and well-esteemed uh, uh, head of Belarus when we didn't have the position of, the, of, of, of president. So uh, soon after Lukashenko came to power, uh, he started to uh, demonstrate that he was power thirsty and he was moving towards absolute power very quickly. And it didn't take much time to, to understand that uh, Lukashenko is, is a danger for Belarus. Uh, and then the resistance started. Uh, 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 and so, uh, unfortunately, we were quite uh, naive at that time. Uh, I, I mean, uh, in 1996, when this mm -hmm. uh, unlawful referendum was organized by Lukashenko, we thought that if we elected once uh, the president, we could do it again. And we didn't... Uh, start to organize the meaningful protest uh, from the very beginning uh, when we saw this danger uh, and uh, sorry but, andrew uh, just to clarify so you were organizing protests since 1996 when it became obvious that lukashenko is corrupting the power yeah, in 1996 i i uh, resigned before the referendum because i wanted to make a statement and uh, to have some uh, effect on, on the situation. And yes, I, I was then uh, not immediately because it is, you know, it is, it is not easy for 
for an official, for, for a person who who is doing something in the office, in, from the office, to go out in the street and uh, to understand how important it is. But uh, yes, I, I did understand uh, quite quickly and was taking part in the protest and uh, moreover organizing this protest. That's true. Uh, and uh, that, that is why I'm saying that this 2010 and 2020 is the, the same process. Uh, I, I would say that 2010 was the uprising and 2020 was the revolution, which is not over. Please, uh -huh. let's not uh, forget about it, that uh, the, re the repression stopped the revolution, but it is not over because the hatred towards regime, I think, is on the peak now. So you so think the revolution a, continued in Belarus? It just went undercover? Yeah. The, the difference, if you ask, I can tell you directly that the, the difference is that the uh, the, the, the best chance uh, that we had to change the situation was missed. Really? How, how so? Why it was missed? Because, uh, because many things went afoul. And first of all, we didn't have real leaders uh, who could lead the, the, the enormous protests and mass, most mass protests in Belarus that, uh, that Belarus ever seen. And it's then uh, somehow the people tr tend to believe to the young guys who were uh, in possession of telegram, popular telegram channels and were doing, uh, you know, some uh, very hectic activities instead of uh, moving towards the goal that was quite obvious. And uh, so I, I think that uh, there was a betrayal of, uh, of the, those leaders who were uh at large because uh, the real leaders were put in jail if you remember Nikolai absolutely Stetkevich. i remember that nikolai statkevich was in and jail Stetkevich, 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 that's they, that's they, very they true were very, very working very, very together statkevich and tikhanovsky and, and pavel severinitz and then oh, yeah. they were all in jail and uh, so uh, i think uh, that was really the story of the courageous uh, uh, behavior of the people and betrayal of the leaders. It is nothing new, but it is uh, very painful for us, Belarusians, because it is it was the real chance to change the situation. Thank you very much, because uh, many people didn't understand why um, nobody took the power as such, that there were no effort to actually take the power and uh, the the role of Russia was huge, and I understand people were afraid that Russia will bring their military forces into Belarus and will stop the protest anyway. So it, would, it was a massive discussion afterwards whether it was all right to have a peaceful process, protest or it was really a mistake. Uh, first of all, about the role of Russia, it is, you know, it is uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, the uh, most scary animal is the cat. You, you remember this uh, uh, tale. Uh, I think that the, the Russia is uh, the attention that is given to Russia in, in such situation is uh, 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 all overdone, and it is redundant, absolutely redundant, and it is not as relevant as people tend to think. I think it's it's quite a, a successful uh, action of uh, propaganda machinery, both from Russia and from Belarus, because, uh, you know, uh, in addition to the war in Ukraine, which was already going on, I must remind you, starting from 2014, Actually, it's uh, very true. My next question will be about that. Uh, Putin wouldn't have wanted to have another uh, critical situation if he mm -hmm. in, in, if he uh, allowed the or ordered his uh, troops or Russian guard uh, to to enter Belarus. So I, I think it was mostly bluffing. Right. And uh, it, in any case, it wouldn't have been important if the there was a leadership. Mm -hmm. But uh, when the moment that, that, that somebody invented this uh, uh, 
genius uh, approach of let's let's protest only on weekends uh, and uh, let's go to the work let's uh, pay taxes to, to to lukashenko by doing a good work during the week the, during the working days and then the protest a little bit on on weekends that that, that killed the protests Yes, I understand. Strategically, it was omitted. The chances were lost. And uh, right now we have a very dangerous situation in Belarus. And my next question is obviously addressed to, to you. And it is coming from all the people who are worried about the situation of Belarus participating, practically participating in the war in Ukraine by giving its territory and also resources uh, to Putin's army. And what do you think is the role of Belarus in the war with Ukraine? And uh, is there a danger for Europe? Because geographically, Belarus position very close to Europe. It's the last stop from Europe, from Europe to sort of Russia and from Russia to Europe. So can we talk about Belarus may become a new ground for Russian attacks on NATO countries? I'm talking about Poland. I'm talking about Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Let us put the record straight because we were talking about this unlike the people who claim to be the leaders uh, today of somebody you are we, talking about officer Svetlana Tikhanovskaya and, and, and her yes, structures because no, no no I'm talking mostly about people who were doing who were building this regime for 20 more, more oh, than oh you years. mean Lukashenko himself and all the surrounding forces I guess and, you uh, and then the, they all, the, all of a sudden they switch the sides and claim that they are now uh, on the side of, of, of the good. Uh, the, the war in Ukraine was prepared on the territory of Belarus starting from 2009. Mm -hmm. And we were always uh, drawing attention to the Zapad uh, uh, military exercise that was going on on the territory of Belarus. And even in 2009, as early as 2009, uh, the scenario of, of this military exercise was the nuclear strike on Warsaw and the tank breakthrough through the Suvalki gap to, towards Kaliningrad. So it's not uh, rumors, it's the true scenario that absolutely, was... Absolutely, and it was prepared up until, uh, up until uh, 21, 2021, when it was clear that Russia is on the eve of uh, invading Ukraine. And even then... Uh, even our Ukrainian friends uh, uh, tried to deny the obvious. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, that is why the, this is uh, and the, the message to the West was always not not it, it, it it's not the message that I'm trying to send now. It's the message that me and my colleagues in European Belarus were always trying to send that without this Belarusian balcony, there would be no war on Ukraine would have not been possible, absolutely not possible. So instead of uh, trading with dictator, instead of appeasing the dictator, you should have put invested money into preventing these dangers. You should have invented money in helping the democratic forces in, in, inside Belarus, starting from 96 and not today only, which you are playing some strange game now. Uh, because because it was clear that this balcony, this territory is needed uh, to attack Ukraine. Because Putin's goal is Kiev. It's not uh, Avdiivka, uh, it's not uh, Bucha, Irpin, uh, where he committed all the atrocities, but Kiev. And for Kiev, he, he needs the, the territory of Belarus. So the danger is still there. So you, do you believe that Putin may attack Kiev once more? It's not that, that I believe. Uh, I think that the, uh, if you read some uh, major analytical uh, stuff from the United States, from Germany, they are predicting that even if some break is achieved now in the nearest future, Russia will be prepared to, 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 for, for, for a major war in a couple of years. Again, so, so, so this is not not rumors. It's pretty it's much Russian rumors. strategy. It's rumors. It's what uh, what is going on because you know Russia is uh, is not an, only a uh, fascist state. It's it's a Stalinist state. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because because and uh, how Stalin was uh, waging the war by killing his own people. 
by sure. sending by sending people with the help of Zhukov to with orders to do everything but to uh, conquer this or that uh, insignificant village. That's what Putin is doing today. The, the, the cost of life, there is no cost of uh, human life for Putin. It's, it's, it's you know... He, so Putin doesn't care about cost of life of no, he or Belarusian care. or Ukrainian? No, or he doesn't care about uh, life at all. He, he is... Uh, 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 he is defecating into some mugs. He is really cared, caring about himself. But you know, the 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 whole his story shows that how ruthlessly he kills people. Uh, people like being killed on his orders, even and uh, and what he did with the with the those mobilized so so called schmobics that were sent without being prepared to to be at war yeah he just sent the basically human meat it's a horrible yeah, thing to say but this is how it appears it's and cannon, cannon fodder and uh, and uh, there is no sympathy at all and but unfortunately uh, russia has uh, a, a very high potential of for mobilization so he can mobilize more and more people absolutely People are not a problem for Russian army. They can just uh, draw people in, in huge amounts and not even worry about it. My next question will be uh, about NATO, because I know that you are seeing Belarus in NATO in the future and hopefully, hopefully in the foreseeable future. So how do you see the possibility of an alliance of Belarus with NATO? Uh, yes, indeed, I edited and uh, I... Uh published the book uh, about Belarus and NATO. And I think that immediately after the that we deal with this, with this regime, this regime is out, we have to take very quick decisions, strategic decisions. And strategic decisions is, of course, uh, Euro European Union and NATO. European Belarus, of course, has, as the name suggests, is moving in this direction. And I wanted to start the discussion because there are several groups that are discussing the security situation, which is very encouraging in, in, in Belarus and security guarantees of the new Belarus in the future. Uh, but we have to find, we have to reconcile ourselves and to, to come to the solution and to come to the decision because it will influence the public, public opinion. And I think, not I, that I think that I don't see any other option, especially after 24th of uh, February 2022, for Belarus to, to, to secure its uh, 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 development, uh, uh, entering, because democracy and uh, development needs security, and security can be provided only by NATO. That is why I'm very happy that this book was uh, really... Uh, supported by my good friends and uh, the best specialists in security issues from different countries, from our neighbors, first of all, and other countries. And I, I will continue this work as, as European Belarus and, and my, myself as, as somebody, as, as the first Belarusian who officially crossed the threshold of NATO, this military monster, as it was called. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, because I think it is great to understand how important uh, is Belarus in terms of European security. And uh, it is great to advocate for security of, of the whole Europe. And what I wanted to talk to you about is that um, nuclear weapons, uh, because I understand we have a bizarre situation right now when we have Russian nuclear weapons in Belarus uh, kind of replicating this uh, vision of the, um, I don't know, Soviet Union when weapons of uh, Russia effectively were in Ukraine and Belarus and then due to Budapest memorandum, it kind of stopped. So what do you think will happen to it? Is it possible to disarm nuclear weapons from, Be take nuclear weapons from Belarus? I wouldn't hurry to claim that uh, they are already on the territory of Belarus. I, 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 I see a lot of bluff. Right. But I don't see any, I haven't seen any reliable, solid proof information that they have been moved 
to the territory of Belarus. Because what they said, both Putin and Lukashenko, uh, initially that uh, in a couple of months the weapons will be there, no. no. And Lukashenko said that uh, we kept uh, intact and in very good state all the facilities needed for new good. He, he was lying, as usual. <laughs> Because I, I I saw I was dealing with nuclear weapons with nuclear di- disarmament I saw what what was uh, on the ground in Belarus and I I don't understand that it takes uh, much more than a couple of months to rebuild those uh, even storages because storages that they have. right so do you think it's a technical problem why they couldn't put uh, weapons on the territory of Belarus I I, I don't uh, I think. M- I, I want to hope, because I was uh, openly, publicly and quite resolutely advising the West to send very strong signals of what will happen if uh, the weapons will be moved on the territory of Belarus. I hope that some signals were sent and it was uh, mostly bluffing in the beginning. And it is not only technical problem, but it's also problem of... Uh, uh further aggravation of uh, the situation of putin uh, whether he needs it or not i don't know but uh, i hope that uh, he uh, could at some point understand that uh, it will be uh, dangerous for him also to move these weapons on the territory of belarus do you think so why why would it be dangerous? because lukashenko is unpredictable so you think he can still and, nuclear uh, weapons? He, his dream is to have nuclear weapons, of course. Okay. Uh... Oh, hello. I think I think we lost Andre. Andre, hopefully he will come back. We've lost connection with Andre Sannikov. Uh, guys, please. Um, oh, we got con- oh, we lost connection here too. One second. Uh, oh Lord. I think we've lost connection, guys, and uh, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to come back again and see what happens, and maybe Andre will be connecting to me again. As we started talking about nuclear weapons and Lukashenko, I can see things got a little bit unpredictable. But thank you for staying with us, and thank you for watching. And uh, I'll try to send another signal to Andre. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you enjoy our talk today. Sorry, guys, the connection is lost. Okay, so let me. You hear? You hear me? Yes, Alan. Okay, so just while Andre is probably trying to get back to me, let me just send him another link, and uh, I'm just going to send him another link to connect, uh, because I can see we have a little bit of a problem. However, I'm just sending him another link and uh he will be able to come back to us so i think i think uh we are back online now right andre andre i'm really sorry as soon as we were talking about nuclear weapons the connection have <laughs> have disappeared i think we were just disconnected the topic is too hot the topic yeah. is too hot but thank you very much for everybody who are still online going through our technical difficulties so uh shall we continue so uh I understand yeah, that absolutely. it is a massive, massive topic right now, uh, the nuclear weapons, and Putin is eager to threaten Europe and blackmail Europe and actually the rest of the world uh, with the nuclear weapons um, deployment and how he will, uh, in, in case of whatever case, he is going to um, uh, deploy nuclear weapons. However, uh, what is this relationship with Lukashenko? Lukashenko is playing along, but Putin is actually afraid of him? Putin, uh, no, Lukashenko is unpredictable because he, his dream is to get uh, control of nuclear weapons. Uh, Putin cannot allow it and will never allow it because uh, who knows uh, what, what uh, role Lukashenko played in Prigozhin uh, you know, oh, attempt yeah. to, to overthrow Putin. Because uh, it's not a coincidence that Prigozhin uh, uh, came to, to Belarus, uh, not not himself, himself. He was very briefly on the territory of Belarus, but uh, uh, the Wagner group. 
so uh, Putin is uh, in a paranoid state like Lukashenko and he doesn't want to probably he wouldn't want to uh, to aggravate his situation and to create more problems so that's why I think uh, I can tell you my opinion I haven't seen any real proof that tactical nuclear weapons are situated on the territory of Belarus are deployed there so but it doesn't uh, uh, minimize the danger because Putin is capable to use nuclear weapons that's true and as uh, Yuri Filstinsky one of the authors in in the book that uh, we presented recently said that uh, the only reason for Putin to deploy nuclear weapons on the territory of Belarus is not to hit Ukraine but to hit Europe all right because, um, yeah that, that's his uh, vision and I think that uh, I can agree with this because uh, it is not against Ukraine where, where they're doing what, what they want using the uh, banned uh, internationally banned weapons like cassette bombs and uh, others like phosphor uh, but to to hit Poland, to hit Baltic states, uh, and to to show NATO that uh, if Russia continues invading uh, former Soviet territories, which they consider to be theirs, they, NATO shouldn't interfere. So it is it is quite dangerous situation because we have a madman in Kremlin, and we sure. have mini madman in in Minsk. So it is quite a complicated situation right now. Yeah. However, many people were talking about Budapest Memorandum. And I understand this is just just a paper and historical document right now because nobody is obeying by the rules or whatever was discussed or promised uh, in the Budapest Memorandum. Uh, however, does it show to the world that if you don't have nuclear weapons, you are basically not considered as the independent country? So if you have nuclear weapons, you are independent and strong. But once you don't have nuclear weapons anymore, you are not considered as anybody of any significance. How do you think about that? No, I think about that, that uh, it, it shows, first of all, that the, the West betrayed us w once again. <sighs> that they didn't live up to their promises, to their assurances that they gave us. Because I remember very well working on this memorandum together with Ukra our Ukrainian colleagues. Of, of course, Ukrainians were in more complicated situations because they have uh, even the, uh, the the missile production on their territory and the uh, had much more facilities uh, connected with the strategic nuclear weapons on their territories. They were very interested in getting some assurances. First of all, of their independence. They were right. Then we, will, we were all betrayed because uh, the West will chickened out and they didn't dare even to uh, start consultations, which is provided for in the Budapest Memorandum. Absolutely. I read the text, actually. I did. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and not, it's not uh, the fact that uh, if you have nuclear weapons, you are... Uh, spared because you know uh, uh, nuclear deterrence matters nuclear war doesn't matter if the nuclear war starts uh, nobody will be Hello. nobody will survive <laughs> so it is uh, that is why it is very painful for me to see the efforts that i was participating in about uh, nuclear disarmament are now being overthrown by by this bunch of uh, stupid uh, uneducated leaders of R russia so no I, I i would say that the i would prefer to have uh, real guarantees from nuclear states than to be nuclear state myself do you think it is possible, taking into consideration what happened with budapest memorandum we only have what a uh, not even 30 years later and and everything gone into pieces do you think the same will happen again or you can get a guarantee that will be actually put in place and uh, have some mechanisms to 
to do something about it if things gone nuclear. No, we, we, Ukraine and us, we, we found the solution. We have to be members of NATO. All right. And then, then we will not need any additional uh, memorandums because it will be under NATO umbrella and the nuclear umbrella as well. So I think that, uh, yes, it was uh, the Budapest memorandum proven how weak any, you know, subsidiary. That's what I'm talking about NATO. That's why I'm talking about NATO, because uh, it is a collective treaty and uh, it has some mechanism to claim the rights of any state that is part of uh, this alliance. Because Budapest memorandum was clearly a failure of the West. It was our very hard effort to get assurances of our independence, first of all. And we really did obey to the pressure, to, to, the, to, to, to the demands coming from international community, from United States uh, to, to become non-nuclear. And we became non-nuclear states, the Ukraine and, and Belarus. And then we were just, uh, you know, ignored. Actually, anymore. yeah, actually, I want here I have to uh, remind people uh, about the death of Igor Lednik in, Absolutely. in prison uh, who was killed there. He didn't die, he was killed there. It is, uh, and he was the one, the very strong proponent of uh, Budapest Memorandum. And he did a lot. We, we talked to him. I, I, uh, he had very revolutionary ideas. He wanted to do more because he took it very personally. That uh, look, we have international document and it is now being buried, and nobody wants to uh, to, to even refer to this uh, Budapest Memorandum. And uh, you you see that the, the, Igor's position on, on on this memorandum is quite. Uh, indicative of uh, of the sentiments of people who are being betrayed by the by the west i must admit that uh we worked together with igor Leidny quite a lot and it was a massive loss for all of us because uh, he was very instrumental in delivering this knowledge to people and explaining what part of European law, international law doesn't work and what is not happening, which is supposed to happen. Yeah. And I remember his efforts to send uh, messages to officer Svetlana Tikhanovska in 2020, and he um, really tried to explain. But unfortunately, uh, the democratic, <laughs> democratically uh, sort of elected Svetlana Tikhanovska decided not, not, not to go down that path. Uh, for for whatever reasons were at the time, uh, however, ho however, um, could you please tell me a little bit more about the time of Budapest Memorandum because it was 1994. Lukashenko just came to power, and Lukashenko was working uh, on basically whatever was required to be done. And I understand he was under massive pressure, and he couldn't do anything but sign the memorandum. And uh, I understand he wasn't really sure what he was doing. And I understand a massive amount of money was given to Belarus and I guess into Ukraine as well in order to disarm the nuclear weapon. There were millions of dollars, probably billions. I can't tell now. I don't have figures in my, but I understand it, it should have been very well paid. Do you remember anything about this time? Can you tell us a little bit more about Absolutely. it? Yeah, I remember everything about this time. And, um, you know, it, it was uh, actually for me. It was very good time because uh, uh, Lukashenko and his people didn't care about such things as disarmament, as international relations. They they cared about the power, about money, about wealth, about how to rob people, how to get rid of unloyal people, how to. Uh, get wealthy themselves, all of them. And uh, that is why it was not difficult for me because I was already uh, at a very high, on a very high position of uh, head of the delegation and I could sign some documents. I never overstepped my you know, competence and authority. But within the, the authority given to me, I could do, I could achieve a lot. And that is why I was 
uh, doing things that uh, I thought were uh, useful and uh, necessary for, for Belarus, and including the, the negotiations about the compensation for withdrawal of nuclear weapons. And I uh, remembered uh, uh, people, I think Lukashenko somewhere said that they didn't pay as much, uh, but uh, initially the, the, the amount of compensation for withdrawal of nuclear weapons uh, and becoming a non-nuclear state was less than $10 million. And then we had to negotiate to get this amount up to, first of all, $110 million and then more and more and more. Uh, and then uh, I remember that, uh, unfortunately, a person who died in, uh, and emigrated to Canada and died there, Sergei Chigrinov, who was the director of the research institute uh, Sosny, where the nuclear research nuclear reactor was situated. Uh, we were, I, I was, uh, I was admiring him. I, I, I knew that I had to talk very hard with Americans to get this money. But I'm not a specialist in, in, in nuclear physics, in, 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 uh, in sciences. And, and Sergei Chigrinov was simply marvelous because he was uh, there uh, from the very beginning of nuclear uh, science uh, in, in Belarus. And he knew everything. He, he was telling a lot of horrible stories how the scientists were uh, bringing the high enriched uh, uranium in their, uh, you know, diplomat cases in there. And oh probably, my goodness! Probably that was the reason why he died so early. So he was transporting uh, uranium in the suitcase. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, he, they were traveling by trains, uh, endangering other people. But it was, uh, it was fifties and sixties. And he was uh, extremely helpful in persuading Amer Americans and giving them real cost of how to ensure the sec security and safety of nuclear facilities on the territory of Belarus. So I, that's why I, I think that I, I was lucky to have the best specialist uh, on my delegations, both from military side, from scientific side, because I saw that they are much better than Russians. And sometimes they were much better than Americans even. So it was uh, very good to <laughs> and very effective to work with them. And so that was the case. We worked very hard and uh, with the help of uh, really knowledgeable people, uh, we managed to get the money that Belarus needed. Not only and that... Hopefully we... you destroyed all the nuclear weapons facilities so they cannot be opened again. No, the research reactor still exists. And... Uh, and uh, I don't want to scare people, but there is uh, the sufficient amount of highly enriched uranium that could be used for at least one bomb. But uh, the technologies, they, they, Lukashenko doesn't uh, have the technologies, so be assured that uh, this, well, at this, today he doesn't have any nuclear uh, capacity. Yet. <laughs> However, there is the question coming here, uh, but what exactly was the undertaking, or as in Russian, guarantee, I thought only for the parties to consult and also to refer to the United Nations Security Council. Surely all that was done or not? I think the question is referring to the Budapest Memorandum and also to the guarantees that Russia was giving uh, to Ukraine and Belarus uh, as a part of this guarantor group, uh, which were Russia, uh, United States, and Great Britain. Oh, the, the, the consultations were supposed to be the first step. And I think that if, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know why, why they were so afraid of Russia to start these consultations, because even the fact of the consultations could have stopped Russia. Mm. You mean in the Ukrainian, in, in the war in Ukraine? Yeah, yeah. In, in 2014. Oh, 2014. Prior to that, in, in 1998, 
Belarus and Russia started creating this state together. It was an early stage of some kind of union, which was kind of taking political power from Belarus and kind of giving it to Russia. Also, economic independence was jeopardized. And this was also a breach of Budapest Memorandum because Budapest Memorandum was guaranteeing territorial uh, territorial uh, sort of unity of political independence and um, independence of economy. Uh, and that was already a breach in 1998. Why international community didn't worry about that? Why they let it go? Uh, because uh, money talks, or as uh, the Russians say, money do doesn't smell. Uh, because uh, it it is started even early in 1996 mm. when uh, the community of Russia and Belarus, so-called community, was kind of agreed with Yeltsin because Yeltsin needed to be re-elected and he was dying and he was prompted by his PR people to go to Belarus and to show himself to be a czar of Russian lands again including belarus and he went there on the 22nd of june to commemorate the beginning of uh, the war on the territory of the former soviet union and that was our uh, our death let's say because uh, for this he uh, allowed lukashenko to go on with his referendum and to use up the power without even reacting for that was that was the the exchange that Russia are capable of. They never, they will never do anything to support the independence. They will never do anything to support the real <clears throat> sovereignty of uh, the state uh, on the periphery of Russia. But they will do everything to to keep the power of their czars, of their Stalins, of their uh, Lenins, or wh whoever. Uh, now Putin. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, first of all, there is no such uh, state. Mm -hmm. It is on, on paper and it is used, of course, to play games again to to, to stay in power and to uh, abuse the rights of the people. But the good question, why the West doesn't react? I don't know. I, I, well, we I didn't try... react since 1998, so I believe everybody f forgot about it. And I remember Igor Lednik was also talking about it, yeah. that um, it, it is not, not a lawful agreement between Russia and Belarus, and uh, it shouldn't be even registered in the United Nations you know, oh, please, please don't don't pay any significance to this. Don't 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 pay any attention to this. Uh, United Nations will register anything. It does mean <laughs> recognition. No, oh, there are certain rules uh, that are being obeyed, and uh, uh, it doesn't mean recognition. No way. Uh, but. Uh, yeah. it, it, the, the, the recognition should have, the, the, this kind of game should have been questioned a long time ago. You are right. Well, maybe maybe now we we could start talking about it, and maybe somebody will react suddenly. Um, Mr. Senikov, I'm just going to ask you our last question, and I'm going to put it here. So, what is your vision for Belarus going forward? And also, could you please touch a little bit on the topic of political prisoners because it is a massively important subject now for Belarus. I understand it was a massive campaign to release political prisoners in uh, 2010 when you were also political prisoners uh, among the political prisoners of the protest of uh, 2010. And uh, whatever references now I can see on the internet about creating a group uh, to release political prisoners, creating a coalition for release of political prisoners, putting pressure on Lukashenko to release political prisoners. All those efforts were mentioned in 2010 and in 2020 or 23 and 24, I don't see any efforts to release political prisoners. We are talking about it. We are worried about it. We are upset about it. However, the statement of the office of Svetlana Tikhanovska was taken in the early 2020, straight after the protest, when it was said that we're not going to do anything, we're going to let them sit there. Uh, 
and we are going to continue our course and we are not allowing to dilute our course by trading with Lukashenko on release of political prisoners. Mm -hmm. So could you please talk to us about it a little bit more? There is uh, a not only Belarusian experience, but uh, world experience, uh, which have to be taken into account and used. I don't see, of course, the situation with political prisoners is horrendous. People are being killed, and I always say, meeting with politicians, and that they are not kept in prisons, they are being killed in prisons. And the five deaths uh, and two suicides during uh, after 2021 um, clearly demonstrate. Can you, can you imagine Pushkin or Lednik or Klimovich dying in tortures? Uh, in, in, in excruciating pain. I, I cannot, cannot even think about it because I was there and I know how, how uh, in this uh, kind of atmosphere and environment which uh, aggravates the suffering, uh, how people are uh, in their last days, last hours, last minutes, they're feeling nothing but pain. True. Uh, it, it is, you know, it is something that we have to try to deliver to the world. And I don't see uh, any any other option than the sanctions. That is the question that we have to put. Why sanctions have been not introduced for, for a, more than a year against Lukashenko? Why uh, there is only one criminal who is guilty of uh, uh, one side who is guilty, which is guilty of kidnapping Ukrainian uh, children, is being summoned in the International Criminal Court? We all know, and it was even on the record of Lukashenko and Talai, that they were proud of taking part in into this kidnapping operation. Why the names uh, of perpetrators from Belarus are not mentioned there? Who is lobbying the exclusion from the sanctions of uh, Lukashenko's bagman like Mashensky? Who is doing everything? Who is lobbying this? Uh, I don't know. That that is the question we have to ask because the trade with with uh, uh, political prison it, it will not help. I even it is very difficult even to understand for the people who have never been in 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 prison, especially in Belarusian prison, that if you start to show that you can you can uh, prefer one group of prisoners to other. It is everything that the regime needs. Uh, it needs that it could uh, easily uh, get more and more prisoners and easily uh, maneuver using the, the, the different approaches towards the release of political prisoners within their position, uh, maneuver its position before the West. And it is quite dangerous situation. So. I think that only pressure, and I'm now talking to the political prisoners, former political prisoners from all over the world. It is literally because I'm part of the leadership council of the World Liberty Congress. And uh, we don't have any other so, instrument. Simply, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Even people who are uh, going through enormous pressure and enormous physical sufferings they say no 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 only sanctions work i am i have a friend uh, guillermo farinas uh, nicknamed coco in in, uh, in cuba he went through i think 14 hunger strikes he was on the verge of dying all the time he would have maybe preferred to be saved by uh, offering by agreeing to trade uh, him for some some preferences for Castro and Cuban regime, but he he stays very strong. He was the only one who was objecting to Obama visit to Cuba. That is the position that helps prisoners. Not let us secretly talk about some other schemes, some some dirty schemes. Let us uh, try to release one or two prisoners. No, no, no. One or two prisoners released uh, secretly. 
as a result of secret negotiations will mean hundreds of more. I'm not against, uh, let's say, negotiating, but let's do it openly. Let's show. I mean, let's create the, the lever to, to leverage this, to make yeah, sure that absolutely. we've got something in our hands. And uh, actually, there is a massive effort now from uh, a forum of democratic forces of Belarus. And I'm putting uh, the text of the petition and petition itself in, in our chat. And I will also put it in the description of this video about the ultimatum to Lukashenko from the Polish government to release all prisoners or we're going to block all the trades from Belarus. And now it is possible because Article 33 from the World Trade Association is actually applied for Belarus. So uh, do you think it that may is, help? That is very important because it is uh, it is uh, already applied, but uh, there is no, uh, no action being taken by any government. I think that is very important, and I know that, uh, as Alan uh, told me, that there are people, students, who were quite active in lobbying the uh, decisive measures uh, using this Article 33. I would be very happy to meet with them. There are also uh, trade unions of Britain who participated in this effort. I was participating in this effort, and many other people were participating, and also uh, transport. You see, it is it is a historic uh, decision because it was the second time that World Trade Organization, the General Assembly, takes such a decision. Which is fabulous, I know. And, and unfortunately, it, but it has to have to be followed up. Because yes. without follow up, follow up, it is absolutely. Uh, Unfortunately, there is no mechanisms in place to actually deliver it, to actually do something about it. Depends it depends on individual governments, and uh, I would even say on the individual politicians. So, do you think there is a lack of political will to do yeah. anything about it? Lack of political will, lack of still lack of understanding of importance, strategic importance of Belarus. You know, again, I, I want to stress. If not uh, uh, for Belarusian springboard that is used uh, by Kremlin because Lukashenko is in power in Belarus, there would be no war in Europe. And if this springboard allows, the, I mean, the regime of Lukashenko is allowed to continue its existence, there will be uh, overwhelming uh, war in Europe in the very nearest future. So you think it's inevitable? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just look at what is going on in Russia and. Uh, just following on on my question, last and I've got three minutes. So, what is the way forward for Belarus? How do you see it? You mean uh, after Lukashenko now? Well, I think uh, we are in the situation first. How we take Lukashenko out? Yeah, of power. absolutely. We have to think about how to take Lukashenko out and not to how to uh, create uh, the fake leaders. Uh, among ourselves. Uh, it is possible because the hatred is not uh, disappeared, has not disappeared in those hatred towards the regime. hatred towards Lukashenko and his regime. Uh, it is possible because uh, the war in Ukraine uh, is really the the war for, for the destiny of Europe and Belarus including. It is possible because uh, the situation is very, very volatile. Let's w watch for black swans that are already flying not far away from, from Belarus and from Russia, that it, something will happen definitely. And and we have to get be ready for that. We have to, as I, as I said, we have to have clear vision where to move after that. We have to have a clear vision how to proceed. Do and, you have a uh, clear vision how to move after that, after Lukashenko? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we did have in European Belarus no problem with the clear vision. Uh, we have to get rid of this regime and then we will, I'm, I'm sure that the destiny of Belarus, as I usually say that, uh, is, is very bright because Belarus is a natural success story. We don't have the problems of our neighbors and we could move forward very quickly. Thank you very much, and I hope we will. I just want to tell to our spectators and everybody who's listening to us that film of Andrei Sannikov will be uh, showed in London very soon, Tuesday 19th of March at 8 o'clock. Uh, there will be a screening of this uh, lovely film called uh, That Kind of Hope, and uh, this kind of hope, and uh, it will be at Red Lecture Theatre. Summer Hall in Edinburgh. Sorry, this is Edinburgh, but it's also going to be screened in in uh, London. And uh, 
I want to say that it is a great success to um, to actually have this this film screened in in London. So I would really ask everybody to to come to the uh, to the screening and have a look uh, at, at the this biographical film, this kind of hope. And I um, believe it will be very interesting for all of us and for all of us who came today to uh, listen to our talk. So. Thank you very much, Andrei, and Zhivye uh, Belarus. Zhivye, thank you, and uh, hope to see you soon. I will, I will see you soon, too. Yes, thank you very much. We will meet on the Anglo-Belarusian Society, Society 70th anniversary. So have a great time. Thank you. Bye-bye.